I don't know if they do this much anymore, but I remember when I was a kid, either during like PE class or during recess, all the boys would be lined up in a row on a field and there would be two team captains. And usually the captains would be the best players or the most popular kids in the class. And they would each take turns choosing from a row of potential team members. And the picks would usually be based on those who were either the biggest, most athletic, most skillful, or most agile, and who would help lead the team to overall victory. Now, based on that criteria, you all know where I stood. <laughs> hey, don't laugh too much. <laughs> but I would always hope not to be the last one chosen. I would say, please, God, don't let me be the dreaded last. But boy, if I was one of the first, I remember feeling like, wow, the team captain saw something good in me. He saw something in me that he wanted for his team. I was special and wanted. Now, I'm sure that must have been how the Gentiles felt in today's first reading. Paul and Barnabas were out there preaching to the first picks, the Jews. And while some received their message and the good news about Jesus Christ, it went on to describe others in the crowd who were filled with jealousy and with violent abuse contradicted what Paul and Barnabas said. Then there was a shift. The second draft picks, or perhaps the last picks, the Gentiles, became the first recipients of God's word. And their hearts were elated. They were filled with joy. The Gentiles were delighted when they heard this. And why shouldn't they be? The people who others thought weren't worth much, who were not part of God's chosen group, now became the recipients of eternal life and salvation, as well as the light God would use to spread his kingdom across the earth. You see, no matter how difficult life is, there is always room for joy. The disciples, they said, were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. They experienced the joy of being chosen. I think back to the time shortly after I received my first Holy Communion at that time in fifth grade, and you were invited afterwards to join a ministry, and my mother said, Kurt, why don't you become an altar boy? Now my brothers, she said, all became one and loved it, and I think you should try it out too. Now, most people don't know this, but I'm really a really reserved and introverted person, and even more so back then in fifth grade. And so I gave the excuse, Mom, I really don't think so. I'm clumsy. I'm uncoordinated. I might even drop the chalice while I'm bringing it up, and it would be an embarrassment to you and the entire family. And besides, I may not even reach the altar because I'm way too short. But, oh, mothers, they see right through the excuses. And she simply said, try it out for a few weeks and see how it goes. And I did, and I ended up loving it. And I believe it is because of that that this is where the first stirrings of my vocation to the priesthood began, serving up so close to the altar, seeing the miracle taking place. And because I was listening to the call of Jesus, the good shepherd, through the voice of my mother, However, it came to full circle many years later when in my second to last year before my priestly ordination, my entire class got to go to Rome to altar serve for the Holy Father, Pope Benedict XVI. And the Monsignor who was running the training in St. Peter's Basilica had me and my classmates all lined up in a row as they were choosing the particular jobs for each person. Interestingly enough, they lined us up according to, you probably guessed it, to height, <laughs> and I was the shortest in my class. And the Monsignor looked at me and said, you will hold the mic for the Holy Father so you don't block his face on TV. <laughs> <laughs> I was so close to Pope Benedict XVI that I could tell you the color of his eyes. You see, the voice of the Good Shepherd reminded me of something that day. Despite what I thought my weaknesses were or my shortcomings, pun intended, <laughs> God desires to include all of us in his plan of salvation. The same thing for any of you 
who may be thinking about the priesthood today, and please, I'm the new vocation director, so maybe I'm plugging this in, right? <laughs> but we truly need good men and good women in religious. And don't let your sins and failings get in the way of Jesus speaking to you and you hearing his voice. Because we are all chosen. None of us are second rate or last picks in his eyes. And this is only affirmed in the second reading today where John had this big vision of a great multitude which no one could count from every nation, race, people, and tongue. Because God truly calls all of us. No one is left out. But what determines those that follow him and those that don't are those who clearly hear his voice. And that is why today is called Good Shepherd Sunday. Jesus clearly says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. No one can take them out of my hand because we belong to Jesus. He has chosen and picked us and holds us in his hand, but we cannot follow him and be directed by him unless we seek to quiet ourselves down, stop the noise that we constantly plug in and listen to his voice. Unfortunately today, so much noise tries to dry, drown out his true voice. So many try to say, you know what? The clump of cells is not really human life. We don't know when tr life truly begins. Wrong. The voice of truth, the good shepherd says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you and I called you by name. The voice of truth, which science also reaffirms, says life begins at conception, that it is a human being made fully in the image and likeness of God with purpose and meaning and with a vocation. So many today are not listening to the voice of the Good Shepherd, the voice of life, which can only come about through a life of prayer and silence, but instead are listening to the voice of death. A few years ago in Sydney, Australia, a young mother, Kate Org, made headlines after she delivered a set of twins prematurely. And one of her babies, a baby boy named Jamie, unfortunately was pronounced clinically dead after birth. And usually the birth of a child is a time of welcome joy, but this time Kate and her husband's joy was intermingled with sadness. Although one of the twins Emily had lived, they were now left to deal with the grief of having lost their other child, the other twin, Jamie. So as the nurse carefully placed Jamie in his mother's arms, Kate sat next to her husband and pressed her boy close to her heart. All the while, she cuddled and stroked his head and whispering over and over again, I love you, my son. I will always love you, and I will never forget you. After some time, there was a fluttering of the eyelids and a gasp of breath, and calling the nurse, Kate had told her that the baby had moved, and despite the doctors and nurses telling her not to get the hopes up, and such reflexes are normal, the baby's breathing soon became regular, and two hours later, Jamie opened his eyes. The headlines read in the newspaper, Mother's Embrace and Voice Brings Baby Boy Back to Life. Today we are reminded of the voice that calls out to us, the voice of the Good Shepherd that brings us true life. It is a voice that chooses us despite our sins, despite our weaknesses, despite our shortcomings. But are we listening? Are we listening? It is the voice of the Good Shepherd who saves us from the clutches of death into the newness of life and always reminds us, I am the Good Shepherd. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. They shall never perish, for I give them eternal life.